This is the Manny Matsakis Show with me, Manny Matsakis, where we will gain insight on how to win on the field and optimize your life. This is episode number two. Uh, today, we're going to do what we're going to call an analysis and application of a book. And um, in, in this one, in this case, the book is called Do the Work by Stephen Pressfield. So you're planning on grabbing the brass ring. You want to take the next step in your career or take on a major project, there's an enemy. There's an intelligent, active, malign force working against you. Step one is to recognize this. This recognition alone is enormously powerful. It has saved my life and it will save yours, Stephen Pressfield. That's how this baby kicks off. This is the first uh, of our analysis and application. Um, it's from a book called Do the Work by Stephen Pressfield. He's also the author of The Legend of Bagger Vance and a couple other books that relate specifically to today's feature. And um, this book is fantastic. Um, I want to give you a little bit more insight and then um, we're going to move ahead and uh, analyze this book a little bit and apply it to coaching football. Now, um, you know, as I look at this, I just want to read the forward to you, and this will give you an idea. Right there in your driveway is a really fast car, not one of those stupid Hampton-style rich guy showy cars like a Ferrari, but an honest fast car, perhaps a Subaru WRX. And here are the keys. Now go drive it. Right there on the runway is a private jet ready to fly, fly you wherever you want to go. Here's the pilot standing by, go, leave. Right there in your hand is a Chicago Pneumatic 0651 hammer. You can drive a nail through just about anything you want, again and again if you choose, time to use it. And here's a keyboard connected to the entire world. Here's a publishing platform you can use to interact with just about anyone, just about any time for free. You wanted a level playing field? One where you have just as good a shot as anyone else? Here it is. Do the work. And this is what this is all about. Doing the work. The title of the book, as you can see here, is Do the Work by Stephen Pressfield. And that's the forward to the book. And I'd like to introduce... Uh, our linebacker coach here at Defiance College, and uh, Matt uh, Warehand is here. And, yes, sir. Uh, we uh, took a look. We did a deep dive into this book together, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, we did. What did you think overall before we start to crank out some of the lessons learned? Honestly, I, I think it can relate to almost anything that you do in life. Um, it just it made sense. It really kind of hit home with some of the things that I've done in the past, projects, I mean, uh, career paths. I, I just... I've seen a lot of the things that he talks about in my life looking back on past things that I've been a part of. So um, it was cool, hit home, and I'm excited to kind of dig into it. With you. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's neat because I, I look at it this way. It's, you know, we on this podcast, we come out and um, this is episode number two. And, um, you know, ne next week we'll, we'll have a, an interview with a, somebody in the profession but this is um, to, by being able to analyze and apply different media. Sometimes they're books, could be video, could be all kinds of different things, whatever shows up. I think we, we have uh, made a decision um, in, in running a football program or our lives and our lives mm -hmm. that there's all <clears throat> types of things that you can learn and apply outside of the box. So to Absolutely. Speak, right. Yeah. You know. And, uh, and, and Stephen Pressfield, you know, I, I've, I've been a huge fan of his. I mean, this book I've read, oh, I think I've read it like four or five times now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a quick, not a very read. lengthy book. 90-something uh, pages. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's structured so you can read it in one sitting. And yeah, it's, you can. And if you get into it, it really does just keep picking up. So. Yeah. And it makes so much sense, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's basically this book is designed 
to coach you through a project or any venture from conception to finished product, seeing it through what he calls resistance right. with a capital R. It's always in here as resistance. <clears throat> and resistance um, is very interesting because he'll st- we'll define it here in a bit, but it's like all these things that show up in your life that are pretty much just inside of you. And out of your control, yeah. too. And that's mm-hmm. the, it, that was, to me, the major thing is that there's so many things that resistance can show up as. Yeah. And I, almost all of them have – there's no control over them. So. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And it's like he writes another book uh, called Turning Pro, which I think will be a great one to, to do at a, in a future date here um, mm-hmm. on the podcast. But I think that what has been interesting to me is – when you take a close look at this book, right? And I just I just want to go back to the book for a second yep. here, right? And and the, he he calls this um, I, I would say the characteristics of resistance. I guess there are basically um, you know a few characteristics here that that he is going to lay into and show you that what resistance really is, you mm-hmm. know, and it's just. You know, it's fascinating to me that the way it all sort of works out, Um, you know, and I guess here it is. Okay, first thing up, get us up to speed on this resistance greatest hits. All right. The following is a list in no particular order of those activities that most commonly elicit resistance with a capital R. The pursuit of any calling in writing, painting, music, film, dance, or any creative art. All right. Two, the launching of any entrepreneurial venture or enterprise. Three, any diet or health regimen. Four, any program of spiritual advancement. Five, any activity whose aim is the acquisition of chiseled abs. There we go. We can get after that one. (laughs) Any course or program designed to overcome an unwholesome habit or addiction. Education of every kind. Any act of political, moral, or ethical courage, including the decision to change for the better some unworthy pattern of thought or or conduct in ourselves. The undertaking of any enterprise or endeavor whose aim is to help others. Any act that entails commitment of the heart, the decision to get married, to have a child, to weather a rocky patch in a relationship. The taking of any principled stand in the face of adversity. In other words, any act that rejects immediate gratification in favor of long-term growth, health, or integrity. Hmm. Now, that's resistance. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a big part. We'll get into the characteristics here in a second, but sure. you know, what doesn't fit into that? I, it's any long-term commitment really, whether that's like he, he said, in your love life or your work professional life, mm-hmm. or if it's just doing something that you're committing yourself to doing, breaking a bad habit, losing weight, anything like that. It, yeah. it shows up in any kind of long-term commitment. It really does show up. And I guess the question is, how does it show up? You know, what, what are these characteristics we're yeah. talking about here? You know, one, he says here, um, there's basically seven characteristics. Number one, resistance is invisible. All right. And, you know, you, you want, you know, obviously we, want to, we understand what, res, what invisible means, but um, think about it. It's like it's something out there that's messing with you. Right. Or as you'll find out here in a little bit, it's not always out there. Okay. Right. Um, number two, it says resistance is insidious. All right. Resistance will tell you anything to keep you from doing your work. Yeah. That shows up, right? Without a doubt. You think yeah. about how many times that, you know, it will assume any form and it'll deceive you. It'll be like, oh, I should go take a break and do this. I should right. go down the hall and have a conversation when I should be doing something else. Right. Is, is what starts to show up. Um, the third characteristic is uh, resistance is impersonal. All right. It's not going to get out 
get at you personally. It doesn't know who you are and doesn't care. Right. Resistance is a force of nature, you know, and, and that's really what it is. It's, it's like you can't control it because it is a force of, of, of right. nature that operates, mm-hmm. right? Number four, resistance is infallible. In other words, it can't screw up. Right, because it's always going to be doing the right thing according to resistance, right? Mm-hmm. And it says here, uh, resistance will unfailingly point to true north, meaning that calling or action it most wants to stop us from doing, it's going to do its best to stop us. Right? Rule of thumb, he says, is the more important a call to action is to our soul's evolution, the more resistance we will feel toward pursuing it. Without a doubt. Right? Yeah. You can see that. I mean, mm-hmm. there's all types of things that will that, that we let show up or we let affect us. Um, number five, resistance is universal. Uh, we're wrong if we think we're the only ones struggling with resistance. Everybody watching this and listening to this podcast is struggling with resistance. I like this here where he makes a statement. He goes, everyone who has a body experiences resistance. Mm -hmm. So that's you, me, and everybody out there. And that's pretty powerful. And and we need to, and and we need to see just how it affects us and what we can do. Right. Number six, resistance never sleeps. You know, he gives an interesting story about Henry Fonda, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and I've actually seen this, uh, where Stephen Pressfield is interviewed and that he, you know, Henry Fonda, you know, tremendous actor over the years and everything. And, uh, you know, even in his, even when he was 75, he was still throwing up before a stage performance. That's right. Yeah. You know? It never, never goes away. Right. I mean, it's always there. Isn't it? I mean, it, it's crazy. It's like just being nervous before a game. Yeah. You know. And you still get those butterflies. I mean. I still feel like a player sometimes when oh, yeah. we start going through warm ups and everything. And yeah. I mean, you still get that feeling yeah. in your and gut. And if you don't, you got to wonder if you're numb to the whole thing. Cause right. Sometimes, sure. you know, we, we put stuff in our head a little bit. And mm-hmm. It's crazy that way. But, you know, <sighs> it's crazy, you know, that, that this thing, you know, resistance doesn't sleep. You know, it's the warrior and the artist live by the same code of necessity, which dictates that the battle must be fought anew every single day. And we'll apply this to coaching football mm-hmm. in a little bit. The, the seventh characteristic of resistance is resistance plays for keeps. Its goal is not to wound or disable us. It is to kill all right. When we fight it, we're in a war to the death. And that's what's happening. Either you win or resistance wins. Yeah. And every day you got to get up and fight the good fight. Yeah. And coaching football, whatever part of it you're dealing with, is uh is a struggle for sure. Um, with resistance. Right. Yeah. And uh, you see it. I mean, it, do, it doesn't matter the task, but, you know, we all have a boss, per se. You know, everybody works for somebody in some particular way. And it, it's like um, we're asked to do something. Uh, it needs to be done with high quality. And uh, it, it may not be the most exciting thing to do, but it, but it fits into the mission of right. what you're trying to do in the program. Without a doubt. You know? And resistance will show up. Yes, right. Very much so. You notice that, right? Well, that, yeah, for sure. And uh, I, the big thing I take away from those characteristics is just how resistance is fair. It's blind. It doesn't matter who you are. It's going to show up, and no matter what you're doing, and if you get used to that, if you accept that fact, oh, yeah. then you can take it head on. Especially with what we do as coaches. I mean, there's going to be hiccups along the way with whatever we're doing, whether mm-hmm. it's losing games or. Uh, players that don't want to stick it out or you know you need to reach somebody in a different way it it all comes back around yeah yeah so yeah there's no question here you know and and after you know these are the things that we call our enemies okay one is resistance the second is something we call rational thought all right and rational thought is um, an area that uh, you, you really have to think through this a little bit because next to resistance, rational thought is our worst enemy. Mm-hmm. Resistance is number one. Let's not 
let's not get anything wrong there, but you know, bad things happen when we employ rational thought because rational thought comes from the ego. This feels like a philosophy class. Oh yeah, right. right? No, that's when I was reading it, it made a lot of sense and but it does. It feels like you're covering a lot of things in this. Yeah, I mean here, here's how I look at it, you know, I see when we rationalize or we make excuses, because you see a lot of that, you know, you, mm-hmm. you can sort of say, oh, here's why this happened and so forth. And, um, you know, it lowers the target to make us feel good. Right. And, and that's what ends up happening. I mean, we're trying to shoot for this, right? And, oh, well, we didn't get there because... You know, we didn't we didn't recruit good enough or right. maybe this guy had an injury. We're making some excuse and that excuse happens. Um, we're just settling for less than who we are. For sure. And that's yeah. and when I was reading this, the rational thought thing came in. I, and my background in the music business was huge for that, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. How is I related to it? Really well, because especially with what I wanted to do, I wanted to be a big time studio engineer Mm -hmm. and I was shooting for a big goal. But then when I started to see that I wasn't getting there as fast as I thought I would, rational thought kicked in and said, well, I can't do this forever. I'm not going to make enough money. I need to go Mm -hmm. back, get a job that pays for some stuff, and then I'll come back to it later. That's what ended up happening. And then later on, we'll find out one of those questions that he has on the test. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. uh, And it really makes sense why I left that industry and came to be yeah. a coach. And, um, yeah, rational thought will kill any kind of oh, there's no doubt. passion that you have or any, I mean, any honestly, pursuit. before we came on this podcast, it was like, the, you know, we were going to shoot it a week ago, and then I put it off, and mm-hmm. then I'm thinking, oh, it's not quite ready yet. Da, da, da. <laughs> you know, and, and it's like, you know what? You just got to go. And, and that comes up here in a bit. Just do it. Do the you work. You just got to do the work. Come in and, here and, and record. Yeah, there's so much cool stuff in this that yeah. I, I think there's there's some so much power to this, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and so so you look at our enemies, right, and those are the characteristics of resistance. You start looking at that. And, you know, those seven characteristics. We talk about rational thought. Here's another enemy, which may shock some people out there. Friends and family. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Oh, without a doubt, that's. <laughs> it's interesting looking at it that way, right? Yeah, uh, it's, with friends and family, with the coaching industry. I mean, I, how many times were you told when you were younger that you're not in the right business, you're not making any money? Oh know? yeah. With what we get paid early on that's in the right. careers, I mean, mm-hmm. family especially, it's, they're not used to seeing that kind of trajectory and that kind of um, early development in your career. They think that you should be making more money or you should be doing something else and. I mean, that's yeah pulling you away from what you want to do all the time. Yeah, and, and you're right. And the problem with friends and family is that they know us as we are. Yeah. You see, that's the whole mm-hmm. thing. As we are, that's how they know us. Uh, they're invested in maintaining us in the way we are. Right. You know, it's like, oh, here's little Matt. You know, he's such a good boy. And, you know, <laughs> mom, dad, grandma, whoever. Right. Right? That, that's how they see it. And, and the last thing we want is to remain as we are. Yeah. It's all about growth and, and, and taking that next step and maturing. You know, you know, with some exceptions, friends and family are the enemies of the un-you, the unmanifested you, the, the person you want to become. They're the enemy of that. Especially if it's not in their world. Like yeah, right? With my parents both being teachers and before that, they were in the business world. They really don't understand what we go through as coaches. I mean, they they hear me all the time. Kind of, yeah. I've been to them every once in a while, but sure. uh, they don't understand some of the grind that we go through with some of these kids. Yeah. And now that that can be related to anything. Really. Well, there's no yeah. question. I mean, so th- those are some enemies there that mm-hmm. exist, and I, I just think just being aware of it uh, makes a lot of sense, you know, but now we also have some allies. Let's see who's mm-hmm. on our side. All right. Cause you can see the enemy side of it, but the allies for us are these six things. And we'll, and we'll bang through these a little bit and give you some, some pretty uh, interesting stories regarding each of these and how you can relate them. Our allies are one stupidity, stubbornness, blind faith, passion, assistance which is the opposite of resistance and then number six friends and family it hits again <laughs> comes right back around so it can go both ways and and, and it's just and it's, we'll get through this now okay the first one is 
you know, he talks about stupidity. All right, stay stupid. Examples of this he gives are Charles Lindbergh, Steve Jobs, Winston Churchill. All right, because any smart person who understood how impossible the task they set themselves up for would have pulled the plug before they even began. All right? You think about that. It's, it's almost like the audacity to ha- be able to pull something off. You know, and I can think back um, – a, year, a few years back, um, I was at Kansas State right, on the staff uh, with some great coaches. And, um, you know, Bob Stoops was our uh, co-defensive coordinator at the time. The other co-DC was Jim Levitt. Mm-hmm. Right? And uh, they were running the defense together. And I remember Jim, um, he, was, he interviewed down in uh, Tampa at the University of South Florida to start the program from scratch. Right. Big undertaking. Right. And I can remember just one conversation in the hallway listening to Jim about it. And it was like, oh, my goodness. He took on something. A lot of people like thought it'd be cool to be the head coach at South Florida. Sure. All right. Neat place, all these different things. But what he embraced, you know, is beyond that. It was almost like it seemed like he just decided just go do it yeah right he interviewed he got the job and he started he was working in trailers for most of his existence as a head coach down sure. there and and he got it done but it's his and yeah that, that's it's his baby yeah yeah and if you go in i mean we'll talk about the, the beginning middle and end part but yeah. i mean if he had a goal for it he sees the ending like that's got to be fun you yeah know, to see and it is and some people scares the heck out of them sure you know but but you know, Jim was not, and, and he, he had a passion for the area, and it made mm-hmm. sense to him um, to basically, you know, do it. You know, it's like right. there's an interesting quote here um, regarding this. You know, a child has no trouble believing the unbelievable, nor does the genius or the madman. There's Jim Levitt right there. <laughs> yeah. Now, it's only you and I with our big brains and our tiny hearts who doubt and overthink and hesitate. Don't think, act. That's where you got to pull the trigger and go do it. Absolutely. Right. I mean, that's, you know, that's what comes next, right? Mm -hmm. All right. The next ally we have is stubbornness. All right. Be stubborn. Once we commit to action, the worst thing we can do is stop. When we're stubborn, there's no quit in us. You know, and a, another analogy for me is Bill Snyder. That's another guy that was against all odds. A lot of people don't realize when he got to Kansas State that it was the all-time losingest program in the history of college football. And some of the things that he stuck to his guns on were remarkable mm-hmm. to me. And throughout all these podcasts, you know, I mean, that's just certainly a, a mentor for me and somebody that – you know, every day I feel blessed that I had the opportunity to work with him twice. Without a know? doubt, yeah. And, and and it's interesting that, yeah, he was stubborn, uh, and, and he had a certain stick to uh to get this deal done. And, mm-hmm. and, and I think that, you know, the lessons I learned from that are like his vision was there. He was going to get it done. He was committed to action, and then when he had the action and it – completed a cycle of action he kept going it wasn't like oh he sat back and say ah yes we won that or we did this it was constantly churning what's up next yeah Uh, absolutely uh, for sure yeah so you see that and you know i think another one which sort of fits in as well is uh that of blind faith and what we say here is our mightiest ally is the belief in something we cannot see hear taste touch or feel you know, it's like when you have your backs against the wall and you just believe in each other. And it goes kind of connects with stubbornness, too. You know, right. Like, like you blindly believe something or you know this is going to happen. Uh, you're not going to quit. You no. Know, you're going to be stubborn. And you're going to say, oh, we still got this. You know, I'm not mm-hmm. going to pull the plug yet. And yeah. Kind of go hand in hand. So remember, these are allies. These right, are the right. things that are helping us. Continue against resistance right. right continue to push forward mm-hmm. it helping us out so you want to be a little stupid on this deal mm-hmm. as he talked about stubbornness is important you know blind faith is important to have that another one is um 
passion. And, and, and I see that a lot. You know, you think about some of the different guys that are out there in this profession that have a really uh, tremendous passion for their players, for their program. Sure. You know, like him or not, a guy like um, P.J. Fleck. Yeah. Okay. You know, I I have friends, and just the, um, just the common conversations I hear about him from others that don't know him is yeah. usually the case, right? For sure. Yeah. You know, and it's like they're all like second guessing him, you know, and like, uh, oh shoot, what, who's he think he is to be talking that way? Well, I, I heard him speak down at the convention. Okay. It, it was very interesting. What'd you notice? There. Uh, that he had some energy for sure, and mm-hmm. he was very passionate about what he was talking about up on stage and how they built the program up at Minnesota and uh, where was he at before that? Western Michigan. They yeah. was just talking about how much they improved, and you could hear it and feel it that he really meant it and he really felt passionate about his job and what he had done and what he's continuing yeah. to do in Minnesota. You know, and it's it's pretty. It definitely uh, is fun to listen to him he's got a lot of energy right? though. <laughs> it is but but what i notice is when he's saying that the conversation in the room out in the hallway after he's done there's a whole lot of doubters it's there's and a, a lot, lot of haters because not everybody can be that passionate about something yeah like or they're like well what is that that's all you hear the oh that's just frou-frou stuff what's he talking rational about? thought coach right that's, that's where the rational thought comes in and uh, yeah absolutely i've it, it's a split room whenever he's talking and you get the guys that really believe what he's saying and then the other guys that are saying nah he's he's full of it you know yeah right this is all the show and, it is and and, and you know, I, I mean, I, I'm intrigued by it mm-hmm. uh, because it is what happens because passion, you know, it, it's got to happen. It's your ally, you know, but what what saps it is fear. Mm-hmm. I mean, when, when you go into a situation and you're fearful and I've and I'm guilty of this, sometimes I've done it before. You know, you go in and you just know you're not going to be very good right now. Yeah. You know, and and you're just like, oh, geez, I'm, I'm afraid for. The kids, I'm afraid for the program, we're just not equipped yet, right. you know, and somehow you have to suck it up, yeah, you know, dust yourself off and get passionate about why you're doing this in the first place mm-hmm. because you, you just can't wonder, you got to do this. Yeah. You know? And if you're afraid of failing, that's going to sap a lot of passion out of it, especially if you're in a profession like coaching or any kind of the arts, if you're going to fail, oh. I mean, you, you got to be willing to fail. You got to enjoy failing because you learn from it. Yes, and, and absolutely. That's, I mean, that's always, I, that's something that took me a long time to learn because I'm, I, I used to be afraid of failing at what I was doing. And oh, yeah. at some point you realize you'll get through it and you'll be better for it. But, oh, there's no question. Yeah. I, I always get a kick out of guys that are out there and say, oh, how can you go through a season, you know, where you just went <laughs> one and nine, you know, and that – and I'm like, well, you know what? If if you gave up and went one and nine, that's one thing. But if right. you, if you come back and you're passionate and you're still putting it in and you're excited every day to do your job, hmm. Yeah. Now you're using one of those allies and, and I think passion will have you overcome quite a bit. For sure. Especially in building a football program. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important because we don't all walk into and Alabama when Nick Saban came in. And even he had some adversity early. Or when Bob Stoops first got to Oklahoma and, you know, a couple years later they won a national title. And it's like, ah, you know. Yeah. It's different, you know. But not everybody, you know, can do that. But yeah, got to have a combination of all yeah. these things that we're talking about. You got to use all this, all these allies you've got, you know. Yeah. The, 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 the fifth one here is assistance, Okay. And it's the opposite of resistance. And we'll come to the, back to this later on, but it's like you want to see it, the opposite of resistance. Mm-hmm. And um, we'll hit that quite a bit here in a little bit. All right. And then the last one, friends and family. All right. When inspiration, success, fame, and money have come and gone, who still loves us? You know, that's, you know, and who do we love? You know, you have your family. You know, a, uh, they say about coaches, uh, there, there's, there's two types. 
ones that have been or will be fired. Yeah. Right. It, it happens. I'm still on the will be side. Thank you. Yeah, well, and, and you just don't know. I mean, at some point things happen that way. Yeah. I remember when I was young and you know, a veteran coach once told me that rich Rachel told me this at Kansas state. And I'm like, what is he talking about? You know, I'm really good. This will never happen, you know, but <laughs> You know, he's yeah. right. I've seen so many. I mean, Bill Snyder, Hall of Fame coach, was in essence, he was fired the first time. Right. And um, he brought him back. Yeah. Brought him back. Won a bunch of games. He's, he did OK for himself. Yeah. But yeah. but even then, his exit wasn't on his terms. Right. You know, so I, you know, there, there's that to be said, you know, but but in the end, what you do have is family. You know, mm-hmm. and, and if we lock everything into our why and why we're doing that, and if it's for our family, you know, it can drive away these forces. And that's what that's why friends and family can be your ally when you let that happen and gives you a compelling drive to create. And I found that they're, they're both sometimes. They are enemies and allies like they have listed here. Mm-hmm. Um, I was saying before that my parents, they don't get it sometimes when yeah. I tell them things. But at the same time, uh, I'm fortunate enough to have parents that, love me unconditionally and they support yeah. me in whatever I'm doing. This is my third career now and they're, I'm all in on it. And they, they truly are. I mean, they helped me get through the first couple of years. Yeah. Um, luckily I, I don't need to lean on them as much anymore, but yeah. they're still there for me, even if they don't get it. And that's no question. what's important there. So, yeah. And, and that is important. You know, I mean, I think as, as we move ahead into the, into the book, what, what's interesting is, and I'd like to just share with everybody the, um, the way the book is actually working as, as we dive into this deal. And what you have is, after describing these um, characteristics of resistance, um, our enemies, our allies, then we start getting into the beginning. And it takes us through a project. And when I mean a project, it can be anything. Um, you know, I'll share later um, a pretty cool thing that I did after reading this on building this program here at Defiance College yeah. and, and how I was able to do it in a matter of like uh, uh, five minutes. Yeah. It, it's pretty neat. <laughs> you know, it's like, what, what are you talking about? Five minutes? Yeah. Well, you'll see. And it, it, I think it's valuable regardless of whatever it is you're working on, you know. So, um, okay, beginning. All right. That's this is the first step, let's say, is the beginning, you would think, yeah. right? Okay, so what's the best time to start? He says, start before you're ready. Right now. Right now. Yeah, get it going. Exactly. That's... You, you just do it. You yeah. know, you sit there and stew around, you got problems with it. You know, it's like, uh-huh. you know, what, what I think is interesting is he says, remember this, okay? Our enemy is not a lack of preparation. Hmm, that's interesting. Last week, I thought we should wait on this podcast. <laughs> it got me, right? It's not the difficulty of the project or the state of the marketplace or the emptiness of our bank account. The enemy is resistance. The enemy is our chattering brain, which if you give it as much as a nanosecond, it'll start producing excuses, alibis, and a million reasons why we can't, shouldn't, won't do what we need to do. Yeah. How about that? That's, I mean, one of the realest things I've ever read. I mean, right? you just, just got to do it. Just start. Get started. Whatever Get, this yeah. deal is, and, 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 and we'll use um, a, a variety of different examples, but in the end, you know, if you're going to go start a new football program or you're taking over a program or you're coming in and you're the new linebacker coach or you're the new – coordinator whatever it is you're doing in this profession there's a beginning Mm -hmm. and the last thing you want to do is sit there and hesitate right just get it going whatever whatever you got to do put the first thing on your list and start it yeah and that's right (laughs) so so here's what's pretty cool now Uh, now we start getting into this at the beginning right and uh, before we begin, you want to do all this research, right? You sit there and say, oh, man, <laughs> let me pull out the research and see what it is I want to do. Wrong. Right? <laughs> I know. It's like, hey, I'm going to – I'm the defensive coordinator. Let me go study all this film to create the defense 
that nobody has ever seen that's going to crush it. The better idea is to get on the board or put it, <laughs> put it down on paper and start drawing it up. Right? And you then, would think, right? Yeah. But here, here's what he says. He gives you a research diet when you're starting. Mm-hmm. You're allowed to read three books on your subject, no more. That's it. And here's what's really hard to do. Because I do this all the time, and I, after reading this book, I just said, you know, I'm going to just do it this way. No underlining, mm-hmm. no highlighting, no thinking or talking about anything. Just let the ideas percolate. Yeah. <laughs> See? I'm That's not, hard to do. I'm not a big uh, note taker while I'm reading something or yeah. doing stuff. I, for me, when I get started on something, I really just... So you're fortunate. I dive into things. But that's yeah. because I don't, I don't like to write things down. Well, see, like <laughs> I've always been in a yeah. situation like this. It's like, okay, I, everything I read or hear, I'm always saying, how can I apply this to what the I'm football doing. program? Sure. All right. And so I'm always – so I, wanna, I don't want to lose it, so I want to put it down. And there's value to it. I've lost so many ideas, a, right? Because I don't write things down. Yeah, I don't. And we'll get notes. to that here later uh, in the book. He uh, talks about how and when to do that. Right. You know, it's but you 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 just got to let it go that way. You know, got to got to let the unconscious do its work. You know, I mean, research itself can become resistance. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can sit there and literally quantify your life and be one of those guys that does nothing but research. And you know all this stuff, but you have no real-world experience and application. There's no substance to it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like somebody saying, I'll study, hey, we're going to be an RPO team. and We're going to study every way that everybody does it before we decide what it is we're going to do. Right. Take what you know already, put it down, see what you like, and then if you want to expand on it, that's where... We'll talk about too as the research comes in a little bit. More. Yeah, I mean, a- absolutely, and, and and I think that's important. You know, it's like, you know, two quick thoughts. He says as we begin a project like this. I mean, one, he says, stay primitive. You know, a creative act is primitive. Its principles are a birth and genesis. Remember, it's better to be primitive than to be sophisticated, and better to be stupid than be smart. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, I, right. I related that whole primitive feeling or staying primitive to just having that gut feeling of something is the way that it needs to be. You just you know. know. And you do it. You might be wrong, you know, but yeah, so it, be it. worry right. about that later. And that's his whole point there. I like that stay primitive. Yeah, so do I. You know, I, I think that that's really important in the beginning here that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. I think that that's that's critical. And, you know. What he says here, and I think here's an interesting example. Now, this gets a little graphic, but it is what it is, right? You know, he says here, babies are born in blood and chaos. Stars and galaxies come into into being amid the release of massive primordial cataclysms. It's like, hey, forget all this organizing thing. It's like, just go. Great things and great ideas happen in big, just explosions. Yeah, you don't need to be sophisticated right. at this point, you know, and, 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 and that, that's one thing to keep in mind. The second thought um, regarding this is swing for the seats. You know, I mean, swing for the seats. If you want to do great stuff, we can't let ourselves work small, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, shoot, man, it's like I, I think – Oh, there's a book, and I think it was Seth Godin, you know, um, and, and and what Seth was talking about, which I'm sure will be on this podcast at some point, is, uh, you know, small is the new big. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you have got to uh, see that whatever it is you're doing can be huge for you. Yeah. You know, and you want to swing for the seats. You, you don't want to sit there and hope. You know, if we don't swing for the seats from the start, we'll never be able to get there. I always thought it was like, you know, if you're here and you're trying to achieve something, if you shoot your aspirations beyond it and you come short, you got closer. Yeah. Right. So it's how you set those goals is really important. For sure. And that's, I mean, you being here at Defiance College is a great example of that. Some of the things that you've done up to this point you're shooting to have a championship program where yeah. a lot of 
guys that I respect in the industry had said, stay away from, like, that's yeah, not yeah. a good job to be at. And, no. <laughs> you know, and yeah. it's it's very interesting to see that. And, I mean, you're, shoot, you're swinging for the seats right now. We yeah, are. Yeah, we are. We, we, are we totally at are. At Defiance, I mean. Because and, and, that's the only way we're in this thing together. we got to right. make, you know, we're going to make something special happen. And, uh, you know, you have to start playing from a position of power. And the only way you do that is by utilizing this balance, this dichotomy back and forth and understanding, hey, resistance is out there, but we can overcome that. For sure. You know, because j just like they always say, you know, when, when a, a rocket is coming off the platform to go to the moon, most of the energy expended is right at the very beginning before, while you're in the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah. You know? Well, it's the same way when you're building a program or doing a project. A lot of work. Right from the start. Yeah, yeah there's no question. Mm -hmm. You know, here, here's an interesting one here that, um, goodness, I just enjoyed this one. I actually heard, I'm trying to think where I saw Stephen Pressfield. I, he, you know, he was interviewed on an Oprah episode one time, right? And okay. I had to catch some of this a few a couple of years ago. And and this was actually something that came out in there and then after I then I went back and I reread the books like aha. It's funny how you read something but then you go back and you're like then the aha moments come, right? It's a whole different experience. Yeah. yeah. Sure. And, and this little this little section here called Lunch with my mentor. All right. And there's a quote that he starts off here with. He goes, uh, Steve this is, with, this is when he's meeting with his mentor, right? Uh, he goes, God made a single sheet of yellow fool's cap exactly the right length to hold the outline of a novel. First thing, I'm like, what the heck is fool's cap? I didn't know what that was. <laughs> then go get a dictionary. You know, and he's basically yeah. talking about, you know, the yellow paper that, you know, you would, uh, you know, that you just get in a notepad. Right. Right. Okay. And that's just the way that it was referred to that, you know, what did he really mean in that statement? You know, and I think what he meant is he goes, don't overthink, don't over prepare. Don't let research become the resistant. Don't spend six months compiling a thousand page tome detailing the emotional matrix of why you want to do this <laughs> and, you know, why this play works, why this doesn't. Right. It's an outline. You yeah. Can, you can fit what you want to do on one sheet of paper. Yes. And then we worry about the details a little bit later. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, he says, outline it fast. Mm -hmm. You know, he goes on instinct right now. You know, it's like, okay. Well, that, that made some <laughs> sense to me, you know, and, and he goes in there, there's a three act structure to this deal, right? There's the beginning and middle and the end, all right? And he gives an example, all right? And he gives an example of uh, Leonardo da Vinci, all right? This is how Leonardo did it. All right, he goes, here's the last supper in three acts on a single piece of paper, right? All right? Supper table stretching across the width of the canvas. Jesus standing in the center, apostles arrayed in various postures left and right, perspective and background tailing off behind. That's all Da Vinci needed to start. The rest yeah. was details. He had his big vision, and then as he's going through it, the minor details and mm -hmm. whatever's in the background and all that stuff comes into play. What's on the table for them to eat? They're not writing that down in the outline. You know, that's, yeah. that's going to come later on. <laughs> exactly. And, so, so, you know, there's these three parts, right? right? So he gets it. But here is the most beautiful part. If you take nothing away from reading this book, here's the one where I think the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. All right? And he goes, the next question is, how do you get it down? All right. He says, get your idea down on paper. You can always tweak it later. Yeah. Right. Without a doubt. Okay. But how do you do that? I mean, some people yeah. sit there and they'll just write stuff down, right? Yeah. All right. This was the trick that made it all fit for me, and Which... it is start at the end. Mm -hmm. All right? Start at the end. It's a trick that screenwriters use. They work backwards. Um, years ago, I heard um, Stephen Covey would do, go, uh, begin with the end in mind, mm -hmm. you know, that, that concept, you, right? It gives you a direction where if you start at the beginning – you have no idea where you're headed. Yes. And that's, he gives the example of Moby Dick in the book. And at yeah. the end, it's, I mean, you have this massive battle between man and beast. And mm -hmm. 
uh, man ends up losing, and that's that's the end of his novel. Uh, he had there were a couple of different words in there, but like that's the end. How do we get there? Yeah, and, it, it's it. So you have to start with the end in mind. That is actually the first step in the process. What do you want this deal right. to look like for you? And then next, you go to the beginning and then the middle. So start with the end, beginning, and then the middle, right? And you know, here's an example. All right, so I did this. Shoot on the. I wonder I do this on the airplane at the end of July, a couple of years ago when I took this job. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I just kept it. Right. So this is a sheet of paper. This is the actual sheet of paper. This is the first time I've seen this. Well, I just, you know, it would just have to be in this book because that's where I learned it. Right. right. Yeah. So this is it right here. This is uh, the program. Right. And I've got beginning, middle and end. Right. Okay. This is what I did. Yeah. Okay. This is what we're trying to do here. So I'm just going to go through this and I'll say here is the end before we took the, you know, before I I even stepped on campus and took the job, you know, was on, you know, took this deal. All right. So the end, a championship football program, all right, precision, passion, high energy that has a culture of caring and togetherness to overcome all odds to the pinnacle of success. That's my end. That's what I want. And that's, I mean, that's a great goal to aim for. And right? that, it makes it a lot easier to say, well, what's going to happen in the next two steps with the yeah. beginning and the middle, you know, and that's exactly obviously still a work in progress, but yeah, but this was done. Yeah. I mean, I'm t- I did this in five minutes and, and we'll, we'll come back to this deal as we come back to the book here in a second. But it's mm-hmm. like, you know, you look at it, it's like next you go to the beginning, all right? And you want to set this deal up, right? And once you do the beginning, then you really want to understand because that will take you to the middle Mm -hmm. where you're starting to fill everything in, right? Right. So, for instance, all right? So let's say I'm sitting here and I go to the beginning. That's what I write. All right. A program in need of a turnaround. Hmm. (laughs) Historically, a loser. Some may have tried and failed. A staff is assembled, trained to implement the art of the turnaround. That's the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now the middle. Order is put in. Disorder shows up. We ignore it and keep putting in more order. Confidence breeds more confidence. We learn from failures and successes. Consistency of focus and preparation put us in a position to achieve victories and more victories and more victories than the end, a championship championship football program. program. Yeah. So this is, this is an outline of what we're doing here. Yeah. hundred percent. Right. You read that and it's like, Oh, that first season, you know, you you had a losing program and after the season you brought in the staff that you wanted to bring in and you see the improvement from the fall till now of where we're headed. And that's the middle. We're in the, the belly of the beast right yeah, now. Yeah, we'll which get, is we'll coming get, up. We'll get that. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the beauty of this deal. But, I mean, that is our football program on one sheet of paper. Mm-hmm. You know, And what happens is this thoughts and chatter, the things that are going on in your mind. You know, it's like all of this stuff that is – basically resistance you know mm-hmm. you look at some oh my budget's not big enough oh we don't have this player we don't have that player we don't have you start thinking about all of these excuses right yeah okay that be that's resistance yep and you have to avoid it at all costs but as we get through this you see how to do this but it's like right. you've, you've got to use your allies when the enemies are showing up and you got to remember the end while you're going through it too, because there's always going to be that chatter. It's gonna, there's always going to be excuses popping up mm-hmm. and things. And if you always remember your end goal, you'll push through it and you'll find ways around those excuses. Oh, I, yeah, <laughs> you're right, Matt. Yeah. And it's like the thing is, what you know, in this book, when he says "don't think," all right, what he means is don't listen to the chatter. Right. All right. And it's paid no attention to the rambling, disjointed images, all the crap that is coming at you. And it's funny because right? I've had to coach kids that I've had to tell don't think before. And it wasn't, it had nothing to do with don't think about what's going on in the field. Just 
you know, focus. And that's really what it is. Don't think about all the stuff that you can't control. I, I've had linebackers before who try to tell the DBs how to cover. And yeah. The D line where to line. And it's like, hey, that's not your job. They know what to do. You make the call and then you play your position. And don't think. Mm-hmm. Play. And that's, you know. That's really what it is, right? Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what happens, you know. Right. And you've got to be ready for the resistance. As, as you know, hey, this is cool, you know, this sheet of paper and explains everything, but resistance is just going to show up. Mm-hmm. And it's how you how you deal with it. You well, know? What you wrote in the middle. It's going to be there. You know, you're going to get the call from somebody that's right. going to, like, rock your world for an instant, but it's like, okay, it, it's how it, how you relate to it. How you react and how, yeah. how you move forward. It's your choice. Yeah, right? without a doubt. Yeah. So now let's get to the middle part here, the middle of the book, all right? And one thing um, we can never, never permit ourselves to do is to take resistance lightly. I see this a lot, all mm-hmm. right? To the, you underestimate it, and anybody that underestimates resistance is going to fail, all right? And because they take into account, it's like they forget to think about, oh, this is a, this thing is out to kill. Yeah. Right. Something's going to happen. You got to be prepared for it at all times. And, and nothing ever goes right 100% of the time. And if it does, tell me how to do it, please. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Know, what's the secret? But, uh, yeah, you, if you underestimate the things that could happen, you know, mm-hmm. that's always what uh, – Expect the worst, but or no, expect the best, prepare for the worst. Or mm-hmm. what, how does that saying go? I don't know how that goes. Well, it's like a what contingency else? plan, basically. yeah, yeah, yeah. But always mm-hmm. expect the worst, and yeah, you know, that's what resistance is. Resistance it is. is the worst thing that could happen. Well, and, and and he does make a statement in here where he basically says, Hey, look, we can never eliminate resistance, it never goes away, but we can outsmart it. Mm-hmm. We can enlist our allies. Remember those allies we we're talking about that are as powerful as it is. That's the key in this baby. Yeah. You know, is, is to be able to make sure that you respect it. Right? Yes. Hmm. But um, you slay it just like you slay the dragon. Yeah. You know, that's the uh, St. George. You know, he respected the dragon. Right. But he slayed it. We get to that part in a little bit too. Yeah, that's right. right? <laughs> yeah, that's where it's coming, right? Yeah. Now, in the middle part here, it talks about filling the gaps. You know, on this single sheet of paper that we start off, okay, we've got what he calls the big beats. I mean, this is this is like what is should be in the core of what it is you're creating, right? right? And then you go in and you fill in the gaps, all right? Now, you do the research. Right. Yes. As you start to fill all this stuff in, now you go back and here. This is what's interesting. And a lot of people, I, I've, I've had to adjust my schedule the last couple of years because of a, a statement I actually highlighted in his book, which I don't use highlighters very much. But when I highlight something, this is legit for me. Okay, okay. I got you. <laughs> all right. And he says, never do research in prime working time. I agree with that. Right? Yeah. Because y- y- you want to work when you work, uh, but you want to do do your research early or late. Right? Don't stop working. Right? Never do. But everyone's got their different times that they're in peak to do other types of work. Like if you if you're working 9 to 5 on a project, yeah. You know, just throwing that out there, then you research at 6 to 8. Yeah. You know. You could yeah, that's up to you, you know, and, and yeah. that that could be the way to go. Like for me, I like the afternoons are a good time for me to research because I'm really productive in the morning, mm-hmm. you know. So it's sure. like, uh, you know, I want to not that you're wasting the time, but he's just saying research can be fun, it can even be seductive, but that's the danger in this thing. You know, we yeah. need it, we love it, but we must never forget that research can become resistance. Like you had mentioned before mm-hmm. about it, you know. So soak up what you uh, what you need to fill the gaps. Keep working on it, though. You know, that's the key: is to keep on working. Yeah. And, uh, and just fill those gaps in. And so you fill in the gaps in, you're doing the research now, you know, and you're breaking it down. And then the next step is to cover the canvas. You know, one uh, rule for working first drafts, first drafts is to get them done as soon as possible. 
Don't think, just do. Yeah, you keep going, you know. And it's interesting, like this deal here, this one page, um, yeah, at some point I'll show you this deal. It, it's, it's an 86-page manual right now, this one page that I have, it's, you know, yeah. that is constantly <laughs> upgraded and worked on. It's like, okay, it's, you know, I call it the art of the turnaround because that was like sort of yeah. the deal, right? So there's something to this, and, and it's a constant uh, process for us, and you, you get this done as soon as possible. And don't worry about the quality. Don't reflect on it. Momentum is everything. Right. It really is. Mm -hmm. So as you're doing this, you want to understand that that is what's critical, that you're getting momentum. Do it, Get to the end. He makes a statement there, something like, get to the end as if the devil himself were breathing down your neck and poking you in the butt with his pitchfork. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you got to drive and go get it. The first draft is never, never pretty, but you just got to get it done. So then you have stuff to work off of. That's that's basically what he's saying there. Yeah, like, right. Finish it, and then you can go back and you can refinish it and refinish it. Mm -hmm. Only thing that matters is the first draft. Get it done, right? Yep. Yeah. Get something done. Yeah. All right. If it's flawed, imperfect, it's not what matters at this point. You're not allowed to judge yourself either. Right. You know, as you're starting to put this thing together. I mean, hmm. Now, here, here's the other thing that's always interesting to me in this day of technology. He makes a statement in here, um, ideas do not come linearly. Yeah. Right? No, they don't. And, and it's like, <laughs> it's the old like, hey, I just thought of this in the shower. You know, you know when you get these eureka moments and right. stuff like that. And, and, I, and I get it, you know, and they just don't come that way. You know, initially, you broke the thing down and what I have been able to do is like when I get these ideas and a lot of times um, the way people our creative mind can work is it happens when you least expect it or mm -hmm. it happens when you take a break from the office and you may be going for a walk. If you have a problem on your mind as you're going for the walk, you can solve it mm -hmm. or, or I have ideas towards solving it. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, I've done stuff before. I carry a little black notepad in the car or if I'm walking, I'll put one in my pocket. But lately, you know, I like just having, not even having the phone, just having the little iWatch on and say, okay, you know, <laughs> it will be cool. I hit the button and I just talk into this thing. like Record it. Yeah, like Dick Tracy back in the day. You don't even know who that is, do you? I know the name. Come on, Coach. Yeah, he had these uh, Apple watches before there was Apple back in the day. He had like a watch in the cartoons that he could talk to and it could do stuff. And that's what this – Yeah, I digress. Okay. All right. so, <laughs> but, that, but that's what's happening. Right. You know, it, it's like you put it out there and it's like I can remember, you know, um, Coach Snyder at K-State, you know, he would take notes during practice. Right. Mm -hmm. And he always used a little voice recorder. And, you know, nowadays you don't see that. Well, yeah. well they no, exist. No, nobody's walking around much, with right? it. Yeah. You know, with the little cassettes tape and his, you know, and his uh, their Back then, they call them secretaries. Today, they're administrative assistants or executive assistants. Yeah. You know, and they would transcribe. Yeah, it or... yeah. He'd say, "Hey, Joanne, here's your uh, here's the little mini cassette," and she'd put on her headset and type whatever he said and organize the notes. And yeah, you know, and this happened every single practice Whew. of his. I mean, every practice. And I was like, "Well, that's that's pretty cool." Love so, to have a library of those cassettes. Oh man. <laughs> The worst Priceless. part is to be on the other end of it. Oh, though, without a doubt. As an assistant coach. Oh, oh, without a doubt. Oh, man. He'd run these meetings, Matt. We're like, he sits at the head of the table, right? And especially in the early years, you know, you, you got some young, we're all young, you know, and coaches, and we're all sitting around the table. Coach Snyder's there, and I think uh, to his right, I was right there, and then, you know, then you had uh, – uh, you had a bunch of, you know, Bob Stoops, Mike Stoops. You get, you know, all these different assistant coaches there, and and we're all like, okay. And I, I think 
being young, it was on the staff. I got that seat, which was right next to Coach Snyder, which is not the one. You don't want you, that seat. Well, I mean, but it was interesting because I, I could sit there and sort of watch what he was talking about. I could see his okay. notes, yeah. which I was like, okay, this is cool for me. The other guys might not care, but this is cool, right? I was going right? to say, you don't want to be next to him and you don't want to be across from him. That's, those are the two seats That's you it. don't want And poor Mike Stoops was directly <laughs> on the other side and he could just stare him down. And, yeah, you know, that's... It is what it is with this. <laughs> Irish bravado of, uh, you know, the Youngstown yeah. deal, you know, that, that was interesting. But, but, but in those meetings, what was interesting to me was that, you know, he would take these ideas that he had and he, and he had this, uh, it wasn't a three and binder. It was a steno pad. Okay. Right. Yeah. And, and every, and he had all of it, you know, the date, the duties, right. And on the side, it had the initials of the coach. Oh boy. Oh, yeah. And yeah. there might be a diagram in, hey, when you're doing this drill, I want it. And then he'll diagram what he wants. Right. So every practice. And what would happen is during practice where Joanne didn't necessarily have the time to um, type all that stuff, he would go in and write it all himself. And then she would just make copies. So we'd come in, and sometimes there'd be like 15 pages oh. for an afternoon meeting after a morning practice. Yeah. And you'd sit there, and, and I would just look down and say, Where's my name? Where's MM? Where's <laughs> oh, man, man. oh, shoot. You know, uh, unfortunately, Mark Mangino, he was a GA at the time, so he, he didn't have a whole lot of stuff in there then. Okay. You know, but uh, you look for... You know, like Bob Stoops, BS, where's he at? You know, everybody yeah. would look for their Dell Miller, DM. If you look for these guys. The less were be was well, better usually. Right? Uh, yeah, because he was making <laughs> corrections in front okay. of the whole staff. Uh, and it's like, oh, thanks, coach. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. And, that, <laughs> and it was the ultimate in micromanagement during the early years sure. at Kansas State, which I understand. If you want it a certain way, and yeah. if, if you're not giving it to him then you're going against what he's trying to build here. Yeah. And that's not And he knew and and others some guys knew. I mean Del Miller certainly knew. He came from Iowa with him and Bob Stoops certainly knew. He played at Iowa and was an assistant up there. So yeah. there were some guys that just knew and mo you know most of us didn't. So that's how he happened to operate that deal. But but that gets to the point of you know, when the ideas come and then organizing them with a voice recorder, or your Apple Watch nowadays and things like that. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, that's how it goes, right? So then then you've got the process, all right? All right. And, you know, let's talk about the actual process, the writing, composing, idea generation process. It, it happens basically in two stages, action and reflection, all right? And when I say that... It's like act, reflect, act, reflect, never act and reflect at the same time. Yeah. See, that's what ends up happening that I think is very amazing on this deal because a lot of guys will sit there and they'll, th they'll have this dialogue in their head of the process when sure, yeah. that actually hurts you putting it together. It's like it becomes resistance in and of itself. Right? Mm -hmm. So you're putting together this defense, right? Yeah. And you have this concept. You're working on a blitz package, whatever it is. And, and you've got all the details of this thing. Then you start to analyze it, you know, and you're going, no. Just do it. Put it down. Put it and in. And then yeah. reflect on it. Yeah. You, you see, that's the difference because it's, it's going back and forth. You just get into this downward spiral and you never get it done. We have the luxury, too, of having uh, our kids run the plays, too. And then we can reflect on it on the film. That's right. And that's yeah. that's what I I learned from a lot of great coaches about uh, coaching fast on the field. You don't want to be, and I know it says it in the book too. No, you don't, yeah. don't want to act and reflect at the same time. And mm -hmm. I got caught early on coaching where I would try and correct them immediately after they made a mistake. Where it's like, just give them a couple buzzwords, and then we can clean it up on film later. But they need to get the reps. They need to do it. Mm -hmm. They need to go through the action part of it, and then we can reflect on it in the film room. And that's where we want yeah. to coach on film. So, and, and that's been happening a lot in, in over the years. You get these, co you get a, a coaching style out there mm -hmm. where they talk about play fast. Yeah. All right. And by playing fast, they're talking about something that you know you have to have quick corrective feedback. Yes. And then you correct on the film. Right. The details of it on the film. Coach right? fast. Love them of later. If they mess it up, you tell them what it was, but it has to be quick, and then the next rep should be coming up because 
I was yelled at a couple times at my last job for holding yeah. up a drill because I was trying to correct something, and yeah. it was not the time. You know, they messed up. Tell them they messed it up. Move it on. And yes, that's yeah. Uh, so, so basically, on <laughs> uh, on this first draft, or, or as we're working it, you know, you want to be heavy on action. Yes, you know, and light on reflection. Very light. And, and then you can make the progress. Mm-hmm. You know that you need to make. You know, and I think that really makes a, a good a good way to go about it, right? He says here also, the answer is always yes. All right, mm-hmm. when idea when an idea pops into our head, all right. And we think, no, this is too crazy. That's the idea we want. Right. Right. I was, and when I was writing through this down, I was like, if you're, like, if I was making a defense and I had a crazy, crazy idea about doing something, oh. uh, whether that's bringing, bringing five and dropping off an end or something like that and doing something yeah. that nobody's doing or it's just, it mm-hmm. looks weird, try it. It's, oh, yeah. Put it in and then, you know, you, you can fix it later. <laughs> Well, you know, you know, it's funny as you say that. It reminds me, and, and and these things happen like at the craziest time. But I can remember talking once to uh, Rich Rodriguez, okay, and R- Rich when he was, I believe, he was at D two school, Glenville State in West Virginia, okay, the head coach. And one day he's in practice, and the sto- it's like of lore, <laughs> this type of stuff, right? And the run in the zone play, you know, which was. You know, just handing it off. Right. And uh, the quarterback just, uh, as he's as he's giving the ball on the zone play, he says, well, shoot, I'm just going to pull it and I'm going to run. Thus, the zone read yeah. was created. Put it in. Yeah. And he was <laughs> like, can we do, you know, one of the coaches I think went to him, can we really do that? What? what yeah. Because they're in the shotgun doing this, right? It wasn't yeah. like it was under the center zone. Which, no. You know, it was 90% like, of teams in the country running now. Oh, yeah, or some version of it. <laughs> right. But it was an accident on a Division II football field, and Rich said, hey, let's keep working this baby a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it worked out pretty good for him. Not too bad. Yeah, and yeah. a whole bunch of other people like that. But but that's the thing. You, you want to be able to stay in the moment and understand, like, just take all the yeses and you'll filter them out as you go, yeah. right? I mean, isn't that the idea he's saying here? The always, answer is always yes. You Put, just get after it. Throw it all against the wall, see what sticks. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that, that is a good, that's a good point, you know. And now it's time to take a look at the opposite of resistance, all right? And this is the best way I, to, for me to look at this, all right? Mm-hmm. He, he talks about here, he goes, the opposite of resistance is assistance, all right? A work in progress generates its own energy field you the artist or coach are pouring love into the work you are getting into it with passion and intention and hope there's serious stuff happening at this point right the universe responds to this it has no choice all right you're a work in progress it gets it's almost like you get momentum going yeah and it's like you're in that flow state and it starts to attract like-mindedness. Right. Right. It comes its own energy. It right. Its own. The players see it. The coaching staff. You can see how one guy, and you get the assistance because you're in it, mm-hmm. and you've got that passion flowing on what it is you're doing. Right. And 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 you got to be good with that. You know, it's you know he says here, assistance is the universal, immutable force of creative manifestation, whose role since the Big Bang has been to translate potential into being, to convert dreams into reality. Whoa, <laughs> think about this now: dreams into reality. Yeah, uh, I read a book once called "Dreams into Reality." There you go. Years ago, when I was in Florida <laughs> State, uh, Milton Katselis, with a K, wrote it. He was an acting coach. And I thought, whoa. And, and, and that that was it. It's like, go in and be that. Right. When you're being that way, you will create a force that is literally unstoppable. Yeah. No, right? I, I agree with you, because then you, you attract the same, the like-mindedness, like you said. And if they don't agree with you, you know, it's addition by subtraction. They'll leave. Mm-hmm. And you'll be better for it because now you don't have those people thinking the way they think. 
around, whether that be coaches or players. That makes yeah. sense. No, yeah. No, totally. So I I agree with you. It's... Hmm. I I think about like uh, PJ Fleck again. Yeah. Like, I'm not in Minneapolis. I mean, I don't know. I'm not in Minneapolis. I don't know what's going on inside. I'm sure there are plenty of coaches he's had on staff that don't agree with his style. And, There's no question. And either they're they bought in and they started to feed off of his energy, or they left probably, or they were fired, or one or the other. You know, and that's. Yeah. And he seems like a guy that if uh, if you're not on the same wavelength and you're not producing for him in the system he wants, he's probably gonna find somebody who is. You know, and mm-hmm. um, yeah. I, I feel like you gotta like for us here at Defiance, I think you got a really good staff here that's. We're bought into what we're doing, and I think the kids feed off of that. I think the, the oh, players, yeah. because once the coaches buy in, that's when you start to get those players too that yeah. really start driving it themselves. And it's basically now uh, it's you in the form of the players as far as the mentality goes. That's what you want. Everybody has the same vision, and the momentum's yeah. all going in the same way. So that's hey, that's why I'm here. I saw it when I came on the visit. Yeah, I mean that's interesting that that, yeah. that you see it that way because you know I, I'm looking at it from my vantage point right now, and I was like, hmm, okay, so it's like get after it yeah. again is really what it is, and don't be afraid to be yourself mm-hmm. and do some things. And I and and I like I said, I have to admit there have been times where I have hesitated on some things, and when I when I read this book and apply it, yeah. I notice its resistance, and just knowing its resistance is a big difference. I mean, it makes a big difference sure. in what it is you're doing. Sure. You know, he talks about Stephen King, right? And <laughs> and some coaches are going to be like, oh, not this you know, deal, right? Yeah. You know, Stephen, Kiss, uh, Stephen King has confessed that he works every day, 4th of July, his birthday, Christmas. Right. Yeah. Now I I know coaches, you know, and and it's sometimes it's like I hate to even talk this way be, because the idea of this website is to win on the field and optimize your life. Yeah. Right. Now optimizing your life can look of a lot of different ways to different people. Without right. a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. So Stephen King, you know, the way he is, he he's going to work every day. You know. And what happens is that I thought was just fascinating. In this point where he's working through it, all right, particularly at this stage, all right, he he wants he gets momentum and he doesn't want to take a day off because momentum will go straight downhill sure. by taking time off. And I'm sure a lot of coaches can relate to that. Yeah, that's the addiction, the <laughs> yeah. drive, the whatever whatever it might be. You know, how much time can you spare each day? You know. You know, it, it's it's interesting how he does this, but Stephen King just keeps working and yeah. keeps working and keeps working as he gets his novel work through. There's always something to be done, in my opinion. Right? There's always something else that you can do. There is. And I, I think that if you spend too much time in the office, is a bad thing. But, I mean, if there's something to be done and you can go take care of it, just get it done. If you're wasting time, I think my, my wife, Lizzie, always, you know, she always curious because, you know, we put in what what to the outside world would seem crazy hours, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but then again, if you're like on freaking Wall Street and you're working in that industry, they're putting in crazy hours, too. And I mean, people that makes more sense to people because there's yeah. money involved. Well, sure. More money involved. I exactly. <laughs> so, so I mean, that's what's happening, and right. and I just think that as I as I look at this deal, it's like you as long as you've got an understanding what balance is for you, if you have yeah. to work every day, okay, I get so, it. It's a great point. You know. Yeah. But but everyone can come it's up with a strategy that works for them. Right. It's you different know? for everybody. Yeah, and it's just knowing what it is. It's just when you're when you're wishy wash and you're one day this way, the other day the other way. If it's not a strategy, ah, maybe you want to rethink it. Consistency. That was one of your yeah uh, things How in the middle, that? right? Yeah, consistency. Yeah. If you're consistently working at the same rate, then you'll get stuff done. Yeah. I mean, that's that's how it works. You just got to keep working on it mm-hmm. and keep working your way through it, you know. And what happens is as you're doing this and you keep working, all right? And while you're doing this, 
you act and reflect like he talked about. Right? Mm-hmm. You keep doing that. It happens again. And you keep going back and forth to the concept that was on this trifold paper yeah. initially, right? And you go back and forth and keep massaging it, so to speak. And you got a shot to have something special happen. But, but you have to be able to reflect, and he talks about this in a particular way, all right? At least twice a week. He goes, I pause in the, rushes wor- in the rush of work and have a meeting with myself. All right? If I were part of a team, I'd call it a team meeting. All right? uh, I think that's a good idea for a football team. You don't have to meet all the time. We do it Mondays right? and Fridays just to set the week up and review the week. You yeah. Know? It's kind of – it's you, now that we're talking about it, you know, we set up on Monday for what we're going to do action-wise. Yes. And then on Friday we're reflecting on what we did this week and mm-hmm. what we're going to have to plan for next week, you know, and that's Yeah, that's, that's, that's out of season, but yeah. I'm assuming we I know I wasn't here last season, but I'm assuming we meet a little more often. Yeah, we do. <laughs> you know, but, but you know, to make sure the communication's solid because right. there's so many moving parts mm-hmm. to it and you know, we'll get to that at some yeah. point, I'm sure. And so, you know, he talks about that. He goes, "Have that meeting twice a week, pause and reflect, you know, what's this project about? Uh, what is its theme? Is every element serving the theme? So it's like, you know, if I'm looking at this, it's easy for me to align with the end here when we're doing, taking on a new project Yeah, that could fit within the program. You know, is this fitting with a championship football program that has – Precision, passion, high energy, culture of caring and togetherness to overcome odds, right, to the pinnacle of success. I mean, that's it. If it doesn't fit into something that does that, you better get rid of it. Yeah. Because you're wasting your time, I think. As far as football program goes, I think that whole middle section, the best way to achieve that, at least one big part, is the weight training program and how guys are in the weight room. And I think that that's what's – been happening for us at least oh, in yeah. this off season. I mean, Chris has put on and put together a great program. Yep, runs a tight ship in the weight room, and the kids have bought in, and now they're the ones bringing the energy, like you said, the high energy and mm-hmm. the consistency. It's there now. And so speaking of that, yeah, you're rolling. Everything's coming along, right? Yeah. Then you hit the wall. <laughs> right. It's gonna happen. Yeah. All right. All right. And then we hit the wall. All right. And here is what's crazy out of nowhere, whatever the project is, whatever it is, all right, our fragile confidence collapses. We wake up in a sweat in the middle of the night. Been there, all right? <laughs> <laughs> that you suck voice is back howling in your head. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, no, what did I do? Why in the world did I take this job? Yeah. You know, you, these doubts show up, right? And, you know, you're, you, but what happens is what you don't realize when you're at the wall, you're poised at the brink of a creative breakthrough and we can't stand it. All right. So we freak out. Yeah. It's common. It's where the resistance is the strongest. Yes. Because they know, because it knows that this is going to be it. Now yeah. You're there. It's coming through, right? Yeah. So you hit this wall. And then I love this next few pages here. He talks about this. The belly of the beast. I'm not a big reader, so I was pretty happy. That yeah, got through one five, word on each page. Pages. The I... belly of the beast. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> All right. And basically, this is when, if you take nothing away from this whole deal here, is welcome to hell. All right. yeah. You're in the middle of this baby right now. All right. And we've got seven principles of resistance and two tests, which these will kick your butt. Yeah. Okay. And principle number one, all right? There is an enemy. Okay. Just know that it's, it exists. There's an enemy, there's, a, there's an intelligent, active, malign force that's working against us, all right? That's number one, okay? Then the first step is once you recognize this, it's really powerful, all right? Then principle number two, 
the enemy is implacable. What does implacable mean? I had to look it up. Relentless. You got it. Relentless. Reading the notes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's it. <laughs> SAT word. Yes. That's what it is, an SAT word. You're right. All right. So it's like, okay, the enemy is relentless. Its aim is not to obstruct or to hamper or to impede. His aim is to kill. All right. Number three, the principle number three, the enemy is inside you. All right. And I like this. Uh, I've heard this before from Pat Riley. You know, Pat Riley, when he was the coach of the Lakers, had a term for all those off-court forces like fame and ego that worked against the player's chances for on-court success. He called those forces peripheral opponents. Now, those exist, and I think mm -hmm. every program around here, you can say what it is. Those are peripheral opponents. I always thought it was interesting when I was coaching at Inca High School in North Carolina. Lizzie used to say, uh, I've got a rule for your players. Can I remind you, these kids are high school, you know. Yeah. Um, I want to meet with all their girlfriends. And the rule is, according to Lizzie, and I thought this was fascinating. She goes, um, if you're in a relationship, you have to stay in a relationship. You cannot break up during the season. Is what she would tell. That's funny. The kid, yeah, okay. tell the <laughs> high school players, you know. And yeah. the girls were there. You know, that was, it's like, no. And to the guys, you don't start a relationship during the season either. That's a good point. That's, that's, Think that's about not, that. a, not a bad rule. If you're out there not coaching high school, rule. that might be some profound yeah. knowledge from my wife, okay? Shoot, that might be a good idea for our guys right now at the college level. <laughs> yeah, Jeez. isn't it crazy? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, she just came up with that. It's a great time. idea like, for well, coaches, too. Yeah. I'm just saying. Oh, I'm sure it is. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, it, it it's interesting how that works, you know, yeah. and it's like, but understand as, as we go through this resistance is not a peripheral opponent it's not what pat riley's saying it doesn't rise from our rivals all right and i like this our bosses our spouses our children terrorists out there any of this stuff that's not where resistance comes from it comes from us from right. within us because i liked I always liked this when I was at Texas Tech, and Leach would bring up some stuff I thought was interesting. And he would come out and say something like, <coughs> you know, it doesn't matter who we play. Right? Have you heard yeah. that before? Mm -hmm. Right? And, it, and that was the deal. It didn't matter who we played. It's just another different color uniform helmet we're playing. And they just happen to do these particular schemes that we need to be able to overcome overcome execute yeah. against and so forth and and i thought that in and of itself makes a big difference yeah you know because you need to execute still it doesn't matter you, what they're doing right if you don't execute then you're not going to win anyway yeah it doesn't matter who's over there you can be going against the air if you don't catch the pass you didn't right? score so <laughs> exactly you know that's that's a good point mm -hmm. you know john wooden used to say he um he was the only one for years that would ever study an opponent's film. Um, he never really had the player study it. Mm -hmm. you know, it was like, okay, I just want to have an overview of how, what it is we're going against. I don't know basketball, but I know enough, like, yeah. we're playing man zone, whatever, whatever it is they're doing. Sure. So you know what to practice that. Yeah. And then other do. than that, he goes, we just work on ourselves. Yeah. And... And he won a basketball few championships. is such a big one like that too. Right? If you run what you run, you yes. you have a better chance of being successful than trying to adapt to the other team. Yeah. Where football, there's a little bit more that goes into it because of the yeah, it, design and it of can. plays and yeah. stuff. Yeah, and it's but. also the design of a system too. Mm -hmm. There are some yeah. systems out there. You know, you're an option team. You know, the great Paul Johnson from you know Georgia Tech and Navy and Georgia Southern. You know, it's like. A lot of time he didn't care. It's either odd or even. We're going to run the triple option, yeah. and here's what we're going to do, and we're going to get after him. He won a lot of football games that way. If you run it at a high level, yeah. you execute, and that's tough to yeah. beat. And the air raid's that way, too, offensively. You yeah. Know, same type of thing. And any and, any defensive coach knows if that stuff gets rolling, it is, yeah, it's tough to out. stop the bleeding. Yeah, and it is. <laughs> and that's an interesting viewpoint as, I, as, you, as you start to come across this and you see, you know, you know, it's uh, it's just one of those things that's inside of you, you know, mm -hmm. that that if that is the key to this thing, hmm, okay? So that's a principle um, that we just covered there. Number three. Yeah. Number three, it's inside of you. Number four, the enemy is inside you, but it is not you. I All like right? that one. 
Right? All right. What's this really mean? To me, I when I read it, I, and I kind of thought about it a little bit, like your mind has been conditioned by your surroundings for however many years. And whether that be going back to all the points before with enemies, mm -hmm. is it could be your friends and family. Um, it could be rational thought. Like it's things that you've been conditioned to think your whole life of this is what you should be doing or this is this is what makes sense. And then, uh, you know, like you just got to ignore it. Yeah. You know, you and gotta, realize you're not to blame. Right. It's not your deep. fault. It's not your fault. This is what you've been told your whole life. This is that chatter going on in your ear, you know. Yes. I mean, that's that's it. You know, the em the enemy is inside you, but it's not you. Yeah. All right, principle number five. All right. The real you must duel the resistance you. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Right there. All right. All right. On the field of the self stand a knight and a dragon. You're the knight. Resistance is the dragon. The only course possible between the knight and the dragon as my son Eli says, is battle. <laughs> He's talking Fortnite, yeah. but it, it, that's it. It applies. It applies here, yeah. It really does, you mm -hmm. know, and it's you have to slay the dragon. Yeah, and that's, I'm just saying what I did uh, about the last one, is that, those, that you that has been conditioned for however many years, and then the you that's going through this whole, uh, this whole project, like you have to shut those things down, and that's basically just... Slaying the dragon. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So you got to slay the yeah. dragon every day. Every day. Every day. Because it, it just shows up that way, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Principle number six. All right. Resistance arises second. All right. This is the key to overcoming resistance. Let me say that again. Resistance arises second. All right. What comes first is the idea. The passion, the dream of the work, the program that we're going to put together, okay? This is the dream, right? We're so excited to create that it scares the hell out of us. Mm -hmm. It's sleepless nights. Yeah. It really is, all right? Resistance is the response of the frightened, petty, small-time ego to the magnificent creative self. That's how I see this. Yeah. I mean, that is what shows up. Resistance is the shadow cast by the innovative self's son. Yeah. He says. That's pretty powerful. All right. And what it means to us is that before the dragon of resistance reared its ugly head and breathed fire into our faces, there existed within us a force so potent and life affirming that it summoned the beast into being to combat it yeah I, I like that <laughs> right yeah i mean whoa you know it, it's just like you know it's gonna be there you're summoning it because you have the audacity to go get after something that might scare the hell out of other people right yeah that's right? like you put there it's just a pain in the ass that's <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it's what it is. I mean, it's totally what it is. I mean, it, it is. It's just simply a pain in the ass. It's going to happen to you. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Be prepared to fight it. And yeah. It's naive to think that you start something like that that something won't come up and resist you. Like there's going to yeah. be battles along the way. If anything's worth doing, it's not going to be easy. So. Well, there's no doubt, and, and you know, it's funny. You know, I look at this stuff. The urge to climb comes first, to do something. You know, you talk about some things, and we'll get to that in the music industry you're into. It's like you had an urge to do that, whatever mm -hmm. it might be. Yeah. And in and, and a little bit, we'll have some questions that come uh, up, right, which you alluded yeah, to. Failed the you test. Know? <laughs> but the urge to climb comes first, and that urge is love. It, it's, it's love for what it is, the material you're working on, the... Be, the coaching, the relationships, the working with guys to overcome obstacles, those types of things, you know, and, you know, I, I just think when he brings this thing up and he says, you know, our brother, it, it's like love for our brothers and sisters 
to whom we will offer our work as a gift. You can relate that straight to football and coaching. Right? I mean, you're working with the guys next to you and the, and the kids, the players. I mean, the guys that you're coaching, I mean, your gift to them is what we're trying to produce out of this program. Yeah. And once they buy in, it's the Saints, vice versa. Their gift to us is working hard and giving back to the program. So that's interesting. I didn't – just kind of thought of that when I was – Yeah, that. well, that's the just, idea, right? I yeah. mean, that, that's exactly what this thing is. You know, he talks about – you know, uh, in Greek, uh, the word eros is life force, dynamis, dynamis, which in Greek would be dynamis, okay, is creative drive, all right? So in that, what he's talking about is it's like you have this life force in you, this creative drive to get this done, and you're always dealing with resistance, right? Yeah. That's what's happening, and you have got to crush this deal as you work forward towards it in the face of resistance. I mean, that's really what happens there. So now moving on to uh, principle number seven, the opposite of resistance is assistance. All right. All right. And, he, and, and I think it's pretty neat here where he comes up with this. And um, here's an example from the book. All right. And uh, I have to give you this one. Right out of the book. In Native American myths, our totemic ally is often an animal. A magic raven, say, or a talking coyote. In Norse myths, an old crony sometimes assists the hero. In African legends, it's often a bird. The three, the three wise men were guided by a star. All of these characters or forces represent assistance. They are symbols for the unmanifested. They stand for a dream. The dream is your project, your vision, your symphony, your startup, your program. The love is the passion and enthusiasm that fill your heart when you envision your project's completion. Whoa. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. I mean, he, he gives one great example, Charles Lindbergh. Was that, I mean, I'm like, oh my goodness. Here's a guy, right, Charles Lindbergh, Lindbergh, who dealt with all kinds of resistance. You know, they, they were given these uh, prizes for the first guy to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean from, I think it was... Was it New York, Long think, Island, somewhere? It's somewhere in Paris. In New York. Yeah. Right? And, you know, basically, all you got was you're too young, you're too inexperienced, you've got no credentials. I don't even think he shaved back then. You know, he was really was young, right? Straight resistance. Yeah, right? No credibility. Everyone who's tried this has failed, and you will too. It can't be done. Your plane will crash. You're going to drown. You're a madman who is attempting the impossible. And you deserve whatever dire fate befalls you. What saw Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh, through? It could only have been the dream. Yeah. That's it. Right? Love of the idea. How cool would it have been for him? I mean, you know, you just got to yeah. put yourself in his shoes. In 1927, to land on an airfield in Paris, having flown from New York solo and nonstop before anyone else had ever done it. Wow. Ended up being pretty cool. Yeah. And it's <laughs> like, you know, it's 1927. I mean, we yeah. weren't around then. I mean, that was, I mean, my father was born in 1932. So that was before he was born. Right. So, but sometimes, you know, you learn from the greats, the masters before us. Right. And here's a guy that pulled this baby off. It's amazing. Yeah. You know? And um, yeah, you're not getting through that unless uh, you really love the idea. You won't do it unless you love the idea. Of yeah. That, you know, and that's now goes, here's where we go, baby. You ready for this nah. one? This is what we've been building up to, among other things, is there are two tests for resistance. All right. Resistance puts two questions to each and all of us. And there's really only one answer. All right. Are you ready for this? Test number one. Here's the question. How bad do you want it? Hmm. All right. 
Okay, that's the first question. Here's a scale that I want you to look at, all right? Dabbling on, let's go from the left to the right. Sound good? Yeah. yeah. All right. So how bad do you want it? Dabbling in it, interested, intrigued, but uncertain, passionate, totally committed. All right. If it's not the one on the far right, then forget about it. Put the book down. Turn off this podcast. Yeah. See you later. I'll listen to you. We, you probably don't even want to listen to this anymore because we <laughs> want to take you to another level. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But it's like you have to be totally committed. So you have to pass that test. Right. All right. All right. So test number two. All right. And this is where basically there's nine options to this. these answers here, right? Why do you want it? That's test number two. Why do you want it? I'm going to go through all nine of these. All right. So we go from one to nine. For the babies. Nah. For the dudes. What's he talking about here? (laughs) Ah, I know what he's talking about here. He's talking about for the babes or the dudes. In other words, you're doing it for the girls. Yeah. Right, girls are the guys. Yeah, yeah. Right, you, you're you're coaching because you look good in a coaching shirt on the sideline, and you know somebody's looking at you. That's one. Number two for the money. Number three for the fame. Four because I deserve it. That's why you want to do it. For power. Number five. Number six to prove my old man wrong, or somebody else, maybe a teacher. Uh, Ex spouse, mother, or something, you'll prove them wrong. Right. All right. Number seven, to serve my vision of how life and mankind ought to be. Sort of like, mm, it's like proving something, it sounds like you're right. doing there, right? All right. Number eight, for fun or beauty. And number nine, because I have no choice. All right. If you checked eight or nine, you should stay and keep coaching. <laughs> You're good. Yeah. You're good. I mean, that's basically what he's saying here. Yeah. All right. So if you checked any of the first seven, all right, he says you can stay too, but you need what's called an attitude adjustment. Right. All right. Because it's you have to adjust some things in your life to make this thing go. Because if you don't do this, you've got no shot. You gotta you you gotta basically check your ego. You know, your sense of entitlement, Mm -hmm. your impatience, your fear, your hope, your anger, because that's why you chose all that other stuff. Right. Right. So, I mean, it's very interesting. You know, the only items you get to keep are love of the work, Mm -hmm. the will to finish and the passion to serve the muse, as it's called. Right. You know what a muse is? Something to do with the arts. It is, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's, uh. It comes from like Greek mythology. I think it's uh, whatever sparks your creative mm-hmm. mind and everything. That's the muse. Uh, but I, I could be wrong. Don't, don't it, it, it's pretty <laughs> close. I mean, um, you know, I, I'm the de facto Greek in the room, and it isn't Greek <laughs> mythology. And there were nine muses, I believe, and each of them was in one of the arts. Yeah, and you were basically you were inspired by the muse. To do certain things, and and that's that's what he's talking about. This, you know. Yeah. So you know, what happens now is you're two thirds away through the project, you're stuck in resistance, and you got to come back. You're pushing through. You're pushing through. Interesting, yeah. because everything inevitably crashes at some point, right? You got the big <clears throat> crash. It's so predictable. Yep. Right. It happens to everybody. Interesting. All right. So without what we just said there, let me let me give uh, everybody out there uh, some names to think about. Okay. (laughs) Bill Belichick, Pete Carroll, John Gruden, Tony Dungy, Mike Leach, Lane Kiffin, Bruce Arians, Ed Orgeron and Frank Solich. What do these guys have in common other than they're great football coaches? I'm going to say that they've all failed miserably at some point in their career. That's <laughs> right? probably what That's it is. what we're setting up here, right? <laughs> it's like, look at this. Bill Belichick and the Cleveland Browns. That didn't end up so good. Even yeah. though you look, oh, they should have kept him. Eh, not really. If you look yeah. at how it was going. It wasn't too good. No. 
Not at all. Right. I mean, Bruce Arians, people say, well, how did, where did he? Well, there's a few times, but one was at Temple. Yeah. He was fired at Temple. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you see the story on him. I mean, you know, my former boss, Mike Leach, what happened to him at Texas Tech? And he was in exile in Key West, Florida. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but there could be worse places to be in. It could be, but but I know yeah. he wanted to coach for three years, and he, and nobody gave him the opportunity. Right, it's crazy. But these are all guys in our profession that have basically struggled through this whole deal, and it was a big crash in their careers. Yeah. Right, and it's how do you deal with that? You know, because you could ring the bell. You know the Navy. The Navy SEALs do this right, and uh, when they're in going through um, basic training, right? And it's like yeah. they can ring the bell and they're done. I'm out. I'm done. Pack and they just walk up. away. That, that's but it's one way to go. You yeah. know, all right. But you know they have a bell. So when a candidate can't take the agony any longer. You know, you do those six mile ocean swims, you got 15 mile full load runs, physical and mental ordeals, uh, no sleep, no food. You know, when you've had enough, you just quit. You ring the bell. That's over. Yeah. How about this one? All right. That's it. It's over. You and I have a bell hanging over us, too. Here in the belly of the beast, do we ring it when things get going tough? Here's the truth to all this stuff here. There's a difference between a Navy SEAL and what you and I are facing right now as coaches, right, as we're out there doing this. Our our ordeal is harder because as a coach, standalone coach, we're alone, right? We have to be able to wake up every day, look ourselves in the mirror, and do this. Now, there's support all over the place. But, you know, we have to make a decision to wake up every day. And it's like, yeah, we have, and this is what I've always thought is sort of interesting. Um, and I learned this as, a, as an assistant coach. It's like, okay, the parameters are set on the program for the coaching staff. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's when we're meeting. If, and it's not everybody does this, but, you know, there's certain – program you've been in a few programs and you have an organizational structure right. to when you meet and what it is you're doing right yep okay you can choose to come in or depart be be it however it is uh along the parameters that are set right yeah right and you'll be fine you're doing that job right but the difference is when you're doing the other things when people aren't noticing. What you do in the shadows. Makes a huge difference, huge right? Huge difference, yeah. You say, and, and to me, it's, it's almost like what I what I enjoy about this is, and this is just a, a little veer off the track here, is like, look, what I, and, and I don't know what it is, maybe it's something within me, when I hear guys talk about how hard I work and all this stuff, <laughs> you know, it's like, or my buddy, Mike Kelly, who I used to coach with at, at the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, our head coach there, and at Widener was our head coach. And, you know, he always – what really irked him was the word of when, – when young guys would say, I'm grinding. And he's like, baby, you don't know grinding. And I could just see it with Mike. You know, yeah. it's like, hey, I worked for Andy Reid with the Philadelphia Eagles, he would tell me, you know. Yeah. And he didn't like – pontificate about this is everything that i did that he did right you know but it's like man you don't know sleeping in the office right you know doing the things that those guys are often doing and it's like so when i hear guys telling me or they have to always tell me for the sake of justification that's that's the best way to put it because a lot of guys want to be stuff a lot of guys want to be acknowledged for how much they're doing yeah how much they're they're helping. And but in the end, it's about the result. Yeah, if you're not doing a good job, or if you are doing a good job, and this is what I – I mean, if you're doing your job and you're doing it well, nobody should have to say anything to you. Yeah. Because that's your job. You're getting, that's right. You're getting paid to. Like, yes, you I, totally are. If I end up having two first-team all-conference guys, I don't like. I don't expect anybody to come over and pat me no. on the ass and say, hey – great job coach. and you may and that's fine the key <laughs> sure. is then you better be humble about it because right. it's going to kick you in the ass later right right because I, I, i've seen that i mean and, been there done that and that's i think right? I, just 
you don't need to be acknowledged. You don't need the recognition. If, yeah, if that's not why you're, you're doing, doing it, right? right? I mean, getting back to those reasons why you're doing it, you know, when you go across the deal. I mean, are you doing it for power? You know, are right. you doing it to serve a vision of how things are? You better be doing it because you have no choice. Right. You don't you, need acknowledgement. You love it, and that's what you want to do. That's the only thing you can do. I mean, that's... Yeah. Look, I acknowledgement is nice it is nice every once in a while to be told that you're doing a good job but uh, if you're if you are doing a good job again i nobody do it for the sake of the work nah, if nobody's talking to me that means i'm doing a good job in my opinion sometimes can be there's no <laughs> doubt yeah and, and here's here's the interesting thing the crashes all those guys we just talked about those coaches that went through the crash now i can tell you some other guys some other guys that crashed and uh, didn't recover. Well, yeah, there was no recovery, man. That was tough. I mean, it it it, it certainly does happen, you know. Um, well, shoot, that's what happened to me with me with music. Yeah, when I was in there. I hit that wall, and I one I was passionate about it, so I would have thrown the book away. But yeah, <laughs> but I mean, I I hit the wall, and I had a huge crash. I mean, I was broken. Uh, rational thought creeped in and mm -hmm. I never went back to it. And that's now I'm here and I'm loving every second of it. Did it for a reason. You know? Isn't that amazing? It is. How that works, though. I mean, I don't know. I think crashes are good. They're you know, great. They're hell. You learn but in the them. end, they're good for us, right? Yep. You learn how to grow. You Fail know? Yeah. Failing is a great experience if you learn from it. But a yeah. lot of people, some people can't deal with it. And that's tough. Yeah. To say the least. Oh, I think you're right. I mean, I know you're right when it comes to that. I mean, I think that as I go through this career, and, you know, like, it's interesting. A lot of people say, oh, I have this career, right? Well, what's a career? By definition, a career is working from one place to another, going with, to and fro. Think about, about careering through something, mm -hmm. you know, like on a ship. You're okay. careering back and forth to get from point A to point Z. Yeah. Right? And, and so as you work through that career, it's like you're going to have some crashes. You know, guys will get fired. It's how you bounce back from it. All those guys just talked about were fired. That's, see, you've been through your own crash too, right? Yeah, man. It was <laughs> That was not easy. You know. Yeah. <laughs> the, the deal at Texas State was, I'll tell you, I struggled with that for the longest time mm -hmm. because I thought I had taken a job. I left Coach Leach at Texas Tech, taken a job, had put together a fantastic coaching staff, you know, and thought that, uh, hey, we're in a great location, San Marcos, Texas, and I'm just going to do everything that I know is right. Mm-hmm. And we're going to work diligently to create an out of the box type of program, right? okay. and, and that was yeah. that was our mission, you know. And I got a lot of like minded guys on the staff that felt that that was the way to go. And you know, I, I learned a ton out of this deal because it's like as we were doing things, I didn't pay personally, I didn't pay enough attention to all the different things that were happening mm -hmm. around me, because in the end, you have to take the ownership for everything in the program if you're the head coach. Right. And so I had made some mistakes, even though, you know, there were a lot of positive things that transpired through this is not paying attention to some other things that were happening within the program and, and noticing where you had people in support of the program and where some people felt stung because they weren't on the inside. You know, there, there was oh, sure. a dynamic to that, that, sure. that, you know, that hurt uh, when it didn't go our way. Because after the season, uh, it was one season, you know. <laughs> it, it's like I still think back. It's like, oh, my gosh, we recruited such a good group there. And that, and most of the guys that we had brought in in basically two recruiting classes, uh, I, I believe went all the way to, like, the final four of wow. the FCS um, playoffs. Yeah. You know, all the way there. 
and lost in the last play of a game or they'd have been in the championship. And it's like, you know, it's like of the 24 starters, I believe we have maybe 19 of them. I mean, From that, the recruiting classes. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, there's 22 plus the kicker and punter. So, you know, so I, I'm thinking it's like, well, shoot, man, we recruit a good class. I just didn't do a good job um, overseeing some aspects of this deal. And it's something that it's a constant state of correction yeah. as a head coach, what you're doing there. So, the thing is, how do you respond to that? Mm-hmm. Well, I did the dumb thing, I feel, in some respects. No, you know, I just got out of coaching for a while. You know, I just started another yeah. business. You know, I just right. got out of it. And, um, yeah, I missed it. Sort of like what you're talking about. Yeah. And then I got back in it. And I was very fortunate to have that opportunity to get back in it again. So, you know, it's never easy you know, but uh, it certainly gives you an opportunity, you know, and um, I think that's how this baby ends up working, you know. Right. But um, I don't know. <laughs> you ever seen it? You ever been a, you ever seen some guys when they deal with the big crash? Yeah. Friends that get, I, get yeah, I've seen it and I've been a part of it. And I, I mean, I've been multiple times. I've been depressed after a big crash and I've seen guys that they go and they do something. They, they either leave and they get out of it for a little while or, you know, people handle it in so many different ways. Yes. And it can affect people in so many different ways that hopefully it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't affect you too poorly that you can't get back to where you were, you know. And that's, yeah. like you said, you, you went and left and you did the magazine thing and everything. Now, <laughs> then you got back into it, right? I mean, that, yeah, you end up doing it. I mean, I just you find your way. I had, you know. I mean, I, I feel like I've, I was always destined to be a coach, but I got out of it because I wasn't in a great place when I was in college and left and did the music thing and then found the game again. And thank God I did. Otherwise, I, I don't know what I'd be doing right now. Mm-hmm. I definitely wouldn't be happy. So, <laughs> well, yeah, and and you know it's. Whatever the cause, you know, that big crash uh, compels us to go back now and solve the problem. And, and that, that is the key. Um, solve the problem that we either created directly or set in motion at the outset. And that's what I went through there, you know. Yeah. Um, in this case, hell is us. I mean, we went through it and, and you have to take responsibility yourself because it, it's, it's not other people. It is you right. in and of itself. And I think our greatest fear is fear of success. You know, um, we panic and panic can be good depending on how you deal with it. Mm -hmm. Right. And he, and he, and he talks about this because, you know, when we're succeeding, that is when we have begun to overcome our self doubt and self sabotage, when we're advancing in our craft and evolving to a higher level, that's when panic strikes. Yeah. It's the same thing as hitting the wall. Pretty much, right. the resistance starts to. You start get to get there, up. bam. Yeah. Right. Okay. When we experience panic, it means that we're about to cross a threshold. We're poised on the doorstep of a higher plane, right? and that is what's important. I think you know when I when I go through this, you know the problem is the problem. And that's all it is. I mean, no matter how you look at it, a professional doesn't take success or failure personally. And, and that's a priority number one for us right now. You can't take it when you win. You can't be thinking you're that great. And when you lose, you can't be thinking you're that bad. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's, that's the top deal, right? It is what it is. Nothing personal. It's just. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look at this. After someone's been fired, you know, for instance, you know, he, what he says here is that our project is crashed is not a reflection of our worth as coaches. Mm-hmm. All right? It's just a mistake. It's a problem, a problem that can be solved. Where did we go wrong? Where did this train go off the tracks? Yeah. The good news is it's just a problem. Mm-hmm. And that's all it is. It's just a problem. All right. So you've got to work the problem. In the end, you just have to work the problem. You keep going through it and find out the way to get around it. Yeah. You know, and that's, to me, that's the end, right? I mean, that's yeah. really where you want to go with this thing. You know, it's, uh, you know, what, what is coming up next as you're working through these problems? 
You ever think about that? What's coming up next? You're working through the problem. You got all this stuff rolling. And then all of a sudden, what has to happen? You got to finish. Yes, you got to finish. In other words, you have got to get to the end, my friend. Uh, because finishing is the critical part of any project. If we can't finish, all our work is for nothing. We can sit in some ivory tower and, and write all this stuff. We can say, I wrote this dissertation. I did all this. I did all that. <laughs> but if you don't finish it, it doesn't really matter. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it Basically, he says here, it takes balls of steel to ship. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, he, bam, that's what he's talking about. And so you want to get the word out. You've got to get this thing to go. All right? And, you know... You just got to get the product out. And what is that product? Well, there's all kinds of different ways to look at this thing. But it's like there's so much resistance at the end. That's when resistance yeah. is the strongest at the finish. Right? And I look at it like this. When you're getting a team through training camp and you've got that team and you're getting ready to play the first game, how you finish – that training camp has a lot to do with the product you're putting on the field in no, the opener. For sure. All right. It's the same thing in the season, too. I mean, if you're having a good season throughout the whole time, I mean, it just gets harder and harder as it gets towards the end. You got to finish every yes. time. And you got to. I, I love the way this correlates to football just because you, know, you got to finish on plays. Yeah. Reps, you really do. Sprints, it's games. teaching that. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, Here's an analysis he gives of Michael Crichton, who was uh, who's a novelist, and he's write, written all kinds of things, and you know he's uh, done movies and you know all these different things. But Michael Crichton approached the end of a novel, uh, in in this fashion: He used to start getting up earlier and earlier in the morning. He was desperate to keep his mojo going. He'd get up at six, then at five, then three thirty and two thirty till he was driving his wife insane. Finally, had to move out of the house. He checked into a hotel and worked around the clock till he finished the book. Michael Crichton was a pro. He knew that resistance was strongest at the finish. He did what he had to do, no matter how nutty or unorthodox, to finish and be ready to ship. See, that's how I see training camp. Mm -hmm. Because you work so many more hours in training camp than you do during the season. For sure. You know, the preparation for it, the buildup of everything you're doing because you have this time with those guys in, in the summer, you in live, August. Live on the field and in the office and yeah. in the classroom. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you're, you're just doing that. But it's like the more you know, you're driving to a finish as opposed to, I've always thought you, you chunk this thing and you get through the training camp and you give it everything you've got to have the best product on the field for the opener. I always thought it was a bit of a cop-out when you hear guys say, oh, the greatest improvement is from the first game to the second game. Yeah. Well, I get it. You're going to always improve. Yeah. But when you say that, it's like you're making an excuse. That you had a bad training camp or you didn't ship out a good product on the first game. And yeah. Yeah. So as, as coaches, we need to revisit what we're doing in training camp if mm -hmm. we have that belief. Because something could have changed that, and you could come out of the blocks faster and better. Right. Yeah. I, I believe that's the case. It's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the thing is, when, when we put it out there, we're exposed. Right? You know, so basically, you get in the team out there, you're going to find out. Right? You are going to hear all these reasons of, hey... This guy can't call plays. This guy is not good. At, all this stuff will show up. And the, back in the day, it was message boards. Now it's talk radio. Now it's, you know, all the different uh, things. I, you know, um, I like watching like Amazon Prime where they do like a, they take a team. They did recently oh, yeah, the yeah. Eagles. Okay. And they took them through their whole season. And they got these guys yeah. that sort of know everything, you know, and, and what you're dealing with there. And you're going to get exposed because you are – the guy that's out there in the arena. Yeah. By yourself. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's that's really 
what it comes down to and yeah. and you're going to get exposed and you got to be okay with it you yeah. know and uh and just keep improving how many times have you told your players to forget about the noise outside yeah oh, right like, well, the only thing that matters is us in here and yeah not the opinions of these guys but mm -hmm. that's yeah i mean you just got to go out there like you said slay the dragon baby <laughs> you know get after that yeah you know and i think as we think about this as we start to close this episode um you know i commend all those guys out there coaching right now you know that you've done the job you've put your best product out on the field you know which is going to be coming up this fall and you know hey we salute you i mean you are busting your tail to do everything you can to show what it is that you believe in is your version of creating that great team that you're going to create this fall you know and it's not easy it's not easy you know and you've joined an elite fraternity and you know whether you realize it or not i mean yeah. just coaches in and of themselves are special people and you know we love to you know have the opportunity to talk about these things and apply it to our game you know um and i think one thing that's interesting is when the season is over, once you have done it, right, what you've got to do here is you've got to start again before you're ready. And I actually I, I think about football season and just the year in general. It's like this book, I mean, every week yeah. you go through this in season. Like every week is a new Every week, Beginning, yeah. middle, and end. There's a project uh, every week, and yeah. that's victory on Friday or Saturday. Exactly. Whoever's, whatever you're playing, right? And then the off season is, uh, it's it's a grind. I know, you know, uh, what's uh, what's his name? Doesn't like that word. When, oh, okay. Coach Kelly. Coach yeah. Kelly doesn't like that, but it's a grind in the off season for recruiting and everything, but that's another book, beginning, middle, and end. And we're looking closer to the end now on yeah. that part of it, but then summer comes around, there's another mm -hmm. beginning, middle, and end going into camp. And that's oh yeah you just it's apply amazing. that so yeah so hopefully everybody enjoyed our analysis and application of Stephen Pressfield's do the work I just want to um, basically read the uh, the final statement in the book here that um, is from Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, in Beyond Vietnam. A Time to Break Silence. This was written in uh, 1967, April 4th, in New York City, where, where he said it. We are now faced with the fact, my friends, that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with a loss of opportunity. The tide in the affairs of men does not remain at flood. It ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is adamant to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of numerous civilizations, are written the pathetic words, too late. And that, my friends, is Do the Work by Stephen Pressfield. I'll be back um, to wrap this episode up with some tips and reminders. Now it's time for some tips and reminders, where we wrap up each episode with some information that you can utilize in your approach to optimize your life. A lot of this stuff is really... Um, just insights of things I've gotten over the years and learned from so many different people that can help you. And uh, here's one of the things that I enjoy um, that helps my productivity. And, and what it is, it's designing structure in your day by utilizing what we're going to call workday rituals. And a workday ritual, by definition, is something that you bookend your day uh, from the beginning of the day and how you wrap up your day at the end. And by having the same thing done on a regular basis to start your day up, you can make sure that you're moving forward in the right direction to uh, accomplish what you need to get done and so forth. So the first thing 
I do is a workday startup. Uh, and it, it happens in the morning as I get rolling into the day. But I always make sure I do this, and it takes like 30 minutes to do this. And, and uh, there's like six steps to this. The, the very f- first part of the workday startup goes like this. I process my inboxes to zero. And that means your email, which would be your digital inboxes and your physical inboxes, because we still have mail and certain things coming through. Anything that shows up, digital or physical, I process that to zero. So it goes down and everything is handled. And um, what, what is interesting to me is when I started doing this, it's like in handling emails and so forth, if I could do it within two minutes, then I handled it right then in this. If not, then I would have to set it into an action item box that I could work on later uh, in some designated time. So I, I could fly through the emails and make sure that I could give the appropriate response uh, as part of my startup. And then the second thing I do is I check uh, an app called Slack where I can respond to various conversations. There's different channels uh, in, within the football program uh, about um, various topics that we're working on. If there's something I need to respond to, I respond to that um, as part of my workday startup. Then the third thing I do is I review the day's calendar in advance, any types of meetings and so forth I may have. And then I go through in the fourth step, I review my goals. And those are my annual goals of things that um, I do uh, prior to every year when I said, here's my top goals that I'm doing. So I go through those um, whatever it might be, nine to 12 goals, for the big, big goals I have for the year. And I review those. And then I go into what is called my task manager. And I have a specific software that I go in and log different projects and tasks into that. And I update it and making sure that I'm good to go for what may be coming up for that particular day. And then I wrap up my um, my workday startup with something I call finalizing my uh, my big three for the day. So what are the three most important things that I can do to make progress on my goals or projects for the day? That as long as I get those three things done, then I've made significant progress moving forward. And that is my workday startup. Now at the on the back end of the day. Uh, whenever that might be, depending on if it's after practice and so forth during the season or, you know, whatever the day shows up, I have what I call my workday shutdown routine. And um, it works like this. It starts off, number one, process my inbox to zero. Then I check Slack again. So I'm not checking it throughout the day. I just check at the beginning and the end in this shutdown period. So I check Slack, respond to the conversations. Then the third thing I do is I intentionally procrastinate unfinished tasks. There's certain things that I might have had in there that are tasks, then I move them forward to the next day or where they belong from that standpoint. And then number four of the workday shutdown is I process notes from the day's meeting. So if I'm in a different meeting and so forth, I always tag with a little box of something that needs to get done or something that needs to be delegated. And I process those forward and and put those in the right spot so they don't get lost in the shuffle. Okay. And then uh, the next thing I do is step five, where I determine in advance the next day's big three tasks. So uh, just like I did in the morning where I set it up for the day, these are the things that I am uh, basically deciding that most likely as I move forward the next day, these will be the big three tasks. But I, I don't put those in pen when I write it in. I mean, those are some things that could change overnight when I get rolling the next morning. And then the last step of my workday shutdown routine is uh, I clean my office environment. I make sure things are cleared out and everything is um, basically taken care of so I can come in fresh, ready to go the next day. And this all takes about 45 minutes. So uh, 30 minutes for the the workday startup, 45 minutes for the shutdown. I try to make sure that everything is bookended in my day in that particular way. So that those are our tips and reminders um, for this episode. Um, Thank you for joining us on the Manny Matt Sackett Show. 
for listening to this podcast. Make sure to subscribe in iTunes, give us a rating, comment on the show. If you're watching this on our YouTube channel, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel by hitting the bell so you can get notifications when we release the next show. So every time we have a new show, you'll get a little ping and let you know that that's the case. And you can feel free to comment below on this specific show. If you'd like to get all kinds of updates, go to the website, mannymatsackis.com, where you'll be able to be up to date on all of our podcasts with audio and video versions. You'll be able to see feature blog posts as they're posted, and you'll get those alerts. So just take a minute and subscribe with your email to receive regular alerts every time we update the website.